ready when you are. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Melvisa Quintus Paul, attorney for the appellate, Ronald Miller. I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. No problem. The Constitution Sixth Amendment. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the Constitution Sixth Amendment, the Confrontation Clause, provides the defendant the right to confront the witness against him. There are three reasons this court should acknowledge the Confrontation Clause violation by the trial court. First, the coroner's documents meet the primary purpose requirement. Second, the documents are formal and solemn. And last, there are two exceptions to ter surrogate testimony and disability, and neither apply here. Therefore, the Confrontation Clause violation occurred in the trial court. The first reason, the primary purpose test, has three factors. One, whether the creator of the report or statement knew it would be used at a future trial. Two, whether the entanglement between, existed between law enforcement and the report creator. And three, whether the emergency existed at the time of the creation of the document or report. In Melendez-Diaz, the court looked at formalized sig signed certificates by a state laboratory analyst and determined that these certificates were quite plainly affidavits and made under circumstances which would lead an objective witness reasonably to believe that the statement would be used um, at a future trial. I'm gonna interrupt you there. That's all, this is all helpful. Um, let's jump ahead to the surrogate witness. You did have a chance to cross-examine Dr. Adler um, and to point out to the jury why um, you know, maybe Dr. Adler was not in a position to show the reliability of the autopsy report. Uh, why wasn't the ability to cross-examine Dr. Adler enough to do? I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question? Uh, why wasn't your ability to cross-examine Dr. Adler enough? Why, why wasn't that good enough in order to vindicate all the rights that this defendant has? Um, to answer your question, Your Honor, um, it is 2019, and the fact that Dr. Hines is stated as being um, unavailable uh, just simply doesn't correlate with the technology we have. So, for instance, now we have Skype, Zoom, even FaceTime. The fact that Dr. Hines isn't able to testify before court with the technology we have just simply seems unfathomable. And well, let, let, let me, I, that makes some sense, but let's assume that I believe Dr. Hines was unavailable. Um, the prosecution gave you Dr. Adler, and you cross-examined Dr. Adler, you showed the jury the weaknesses of Dr. Adler's ability to demonstrate the truth of the autopsy report. You did your best to poke holes in the autopsy report and in Dr. Adler's testimony, and the jury disagreed with you. It seems to me that that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, respectfully, Your Honor, with that, um, Dr. Adler was not present and cannot um, exhume the body for herself. Um, we are human, therefore there is human error, and the fact that Dr. Adler could not testify and relate any information as to whether the possibility existed um, is, a, is a factor. Um, she can testify about procedure, and we are not dis we're not um, saying that procedurally she could be incorrect. We are talking about the fact that she's taken notes from the document and talked to Dr. Hines about it, um, and then is not necessarily coming up with her own conclusion, but more so relying on the statements made by Dr. Hines in the document. That's helpful. Would, would you say that Dr. Adler is pretty similar to the surrogate witness in Volkoming, where the Supreme Court said this surrogate witness is not sufficient and cannot testify? Um, we would say so, yes, Your Honor, um, for the same reason as uh, far as um, in that case, um, in Bullcoming, the court saw that um, a surrogate can't really relay information that happened in that room at that time. Um, what about the lower courts? Talk to me about them. And, and talk to me about lower courts that have considered the question of whether an autopsy report is testimony. Uh, for instance, in the Gnasiak, uh, there the court saw um, multiple autopsy reports created by different analysts um, and there they used one um, person to testify. And there they saw a problem, again, with the factor of human error and just analysis that could be missed because that person was not in the room. Great, great. That's, um, that's great, we're out of time. Good job. <laughs>
Excellent job, Melvi. Uh, not, not surprising. Great. And you would do great. Uh, you should, uh, let's see. So who did gave the compliment uh, last time? You were the last one to go, so now it's on there. I thought the way you kept your cool through all the answers, like you were so even keel and your responses were, you could not tell at all. Like if you were nervous, it did not show. Like I'm still you, shaking. So. <laughs> <laughs> you really came across as knowledgeable and I honestly enjoyed your answers, so good job. I thought that you answered every question well, uh, every single question well, and if you were nervous, it didn't show. Um, I thought you started with a great roadmap, very clear. Um, started general, got work, and then were prepared to get specific, and then began to get specific, and then I inter interrupted you. Um, I thought you had um, a, a good explanation of why Heinz maybe was available, um, but um, I thought you had a really, really good answer to the follow-up question. The follow-up questions are almost always harder than the original questions. Um, and. Um, so your follow-up question to, you know, why wasn't Adler good enough, wasn't present, you know, all the things that you mentioned, um, human error, all of that, I thought that was spot on. And then a good answer in the lower courts, you know, I think you should, you, everyone should be prepared to not just talk about big three Supreme Court cases, Melinda's Diaz, Oakley and Williams, um, but um, at least some, some lower court case. Um, and you had Ignaziak right on the tip of your tongue. I don't know if you had it in your notes right in front of you or not, but whether you did or not, um, you know, you knew it, you knew it thoroughly, and there was no, there was no hesitation. Not that hesitation is the end of the world, but better to hesitate and get the answer right than to um, rush into an answer. Um, but you did, a, you did a great job. Um, so you should feel great about it, and you, feel, you should feel great going in Saturday. Right. Next up is, okay, so here's the order. Melvi, Priya, then Zach, then Dimitri, then Shelby Boyd, then Taylor, then Jacob. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Priya Nair, and I represent appellant Ronald Miller. I would, um, at this time, Your Honors, I would like to request two minutes for rebuttal. That's granted. Thank you. The defense respectfully requests the court to exclude Dr. Hines' autopsy report and Dr. Monica Adler's surrogate testimony because this evidence is a direct violation of Ronald Miller's rights protected under the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause of the United States Constitution. The binding interpretation of the Confrontation Clause laid out in the Supreme Court case, Crawford v. Washington, requires witnesses who provide testimonial evidence to the court to be present at trial and allow the defense a prior opportunity for cross-examination. The defense makes two arguments. The autopsy report is inadmissible because it is testimonial and Dr. Adler's surrogate testimony is inadmissible because it is an insufficient substitute for Dr. Hines' required in-court statements on the autopsy. Let me ask about this question of what happens when the medical examiner dies. Um, under your argument, whether a homicide can be prosecuted depends on whether the medical examiner happens to have died before the trial. That seems like a very random distribution of protection for murder victims. Um, how, how can that be right? So um, I would first like to point out that um, the confrontation clause is made to protect um, the defendant's rights. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, I cited in, or we cited in our brief um, the Indiana Code um, section 36214-6A. Um, and in that code, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not where it is. Never mind, forget that okay. stuff. What about, um, this what about this scenario, what about this proposal? We, we agree with all of your rules, all of your tests, 
you win in this case. But we establish a rule, we establish an exception. If the medical examiner has died, then the autopsy report can be admitted into evidence without the medical examiner there. Does that sound fair? I'm sorry, repeat the question. What about the, what if we create an exception to the rule? And under this exception, you would still win this case. Yes. Normally, the rule is autopsy report cannot be admitted into evidence because it's testimonial unless the medical examiner who wrote the autopsy report testifies. Mm -hmm. But if the medical examiner has died before the trial, then there's an exception to that rule. If the medical examiner has died, then the autopsy report can be admitted into evidence. Um, yes, with maybe one qualification. I actually found what I was looking for before. Um, in the Indiana State Code, um, it says that um, the remains of the decedent's body may be held until investigation and cause of death are concluded. Um, so I would say that the investigation was still going on even though the cause of death was concluded mm -hmm. when Dr. Hines left. Um, so in that case, if Dr. Hines did die and the body was still available through this um, process, that if Dr. Adler were to go see the body and observe it, then she should be able to testify in court. Uh, I mean, that seems fair. It seems tough on the family of the victim. Like, they don't get to bury their loved ones for you know, two years, three years, four years. I agree, but... Um, <laughs> Haven't they been through enough? <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but um, the case that we're arguing is that there is a constitutional right that's been violated. Um, although, yes, it is hard on the family to not be able to bury their loved one, um, there's still an investigation going on, and the court should have um, the right to do what's in the court. Good. All right. Well, we're out of time. Good job. All right. Uh, Sam. Yeah. Um, for not liking public speaking, <laughs> your uh, tone and volume and speed and all that stuff is really good. So. I think I talk louder when I'm nervous. Yeah. And <laughs> usually, if, like, again, if like, everybody's nervous, they talk super fast, but you were really, your speed was perfect at the beginning, so it's awesome. Yep, I agree with that. Really good speed, not talking too fast. Uh, I thought you did a really nice job of always um, returning to the purpose of the right. You know, this is not a right to protect uh, victims of crime. This is not a, a right designed to convict every guilty person ever. It's a right that's designed to protect defendants um, because somewhere out there, there's a chance that there will be uh, an innocent defendant. Uh, it's, it's rights like the Confrontation Clause that are designed to make sure we don't get them. Um, and I think you, that was a theme that you uh, returned to um, several times, and I think that's, that's part of the right answer to these kind of like more practical, well, doesn't this mean some innocent people will go free, some guilty people will go free or something like that. Um, you know, I think if you, get, if you get asked these kinds of like pragmatic questions, you don't want to seem like an extremist, which you didn't seem be like, you know, I never care. I don't care about that at all, that guilty people are going to go free. Um, but um, I do think that, um, you know, you return, you return to the principle that, you know, better that better some, better some guilty go free than, um, than a lot of innocent get convicted. Uh, so um, I thought that was good, and um, good job keeping your cool when you didn't find what you were looking for right away, and then um, circle back to it. Um, and, uh, and also a good job uh, keeping your cool for some uh, pretty unusual questions we hadn't, we hadn't talked about. We talked about the dead corner before, but we hadn't talked about some of the other more non-legal questions. But be prepared for that. You know, judges, especially judges who don't know the law very well, um, you know, they're going to kind of, they're going to like to ask kind of common sense, like how would this work in the real world? What about the victim's family? Um, just as a heads up, I'm going to ask someone today what the standard of review is because that's like a question that judges sometimes like to ask. So it's really easy. The standard review is de novo.
That's, that's all we say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they ask what de novo means, you should be able to explain what it means, which is that the appellate court gives no deference to the lower court um, and decides the question fresh. Um, but um, it's not a hard question, but it's just a question that um, might throw you if you're not ready for it. Is is it okay if I use my laptop? My dog shredded my notebook. That's the oldest excuse in the book. You should see some of my books. Dog ate my homework. <laughs> He's shredded one of my law school books, so. Yeah. He's certainly just not like homework. Right. All right. Let's see, what kind of, let's see what kind of excuses you're making out of the UK with this. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Zach Doniger, and I'm representing the state of Brandeis, and I am requesting the court affirm the defendant's murder conviction. The Confrontation Clause prevents testimonial out-of-court statements from witnesses who are not available for cross-examination in court. Um, this, in this case, it was not a violation because the, te the evidence was not testimonial. There are two um, main tests to decide whether evidence is testimonial, the primary purpose test and the formality test. In, determining, or in deciding the primary purpose test, the court must look at three key uh, factors, whether the suspect or whether the defendant was a suspect at the time of the autopsy, whether the report was made to or by or at the request of the police, and whether it was the report was made in the regular course of business. The second test is the formality test. So let me stop there and let's just go through all three. Okay. And I'll, I'll kind of tell you where I am and you tell me why I'm wrong. Okay. Um, on the first part of that test, whether the defendant was a suspect, <coughs> like, her blood was literally on his hands. He was the only person at the crime scene. He was the only person with the opportunity to kill him. Yes, it might have been a suicide, but maybe not. They didn't know for sure. If they'd known for sure it was a suicide, there would have been no purpose of the autopsy report. So it seems to me he was a suspect. The second, let me go through all three and then you tell me. The second thing seems like, well, actually, stop there. Okay, let's go with the first one. Yeah, just first one. Okay, so uh, even the responding officer at the crime scene believed that it was a suicide. He believed that there was no reason to even suspect foul play. Um, the only reason the autopsy report was done was not because they believed it to be a murder, but uh, per Brandeis statute, which states um, that when a coroner is notified that a person dies from either violence, cas uh, casualty, when in good health, um, if there are suspicious, unusual, unnatural circumstances or somebody's just found dead, the coroner should conduct the medical investigation. So it doesn't even have to be from a murder investigation, just simply that somebody has been found dead. But isn't the whole purpose of that rule to rule out foul play? No, I think it more is to give families answers for why their loved ones have died. So, I mean, even the exception that it, in good health, I mean, anybody can die when an apparent good health, whether it be from heart attack or stroke or car accident. Um, if it's just for the family's benefit, why not let the family decide whether to have an autopsy? I don't have an answer for that one. That's all right. Um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think you're very much on the right track for, for um, showing that there wasn't a suspect. Um, and in particular, that the officer didn't know, or that the officer believed it was a suicide. Let's do the second one. Um, it was whether it was made to law enforcement or not. There's a regulation, as I understand it, that um, once the medical examiner concludes that it's homicide, that that um, report gets sent to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and even if there weren't a regulation, any <coughs> adult, you know, would, suspect would, that would murder would report that police. once you say this is homicide, that that report is going to be of interest to the police. Mm -hmm. uh, so why wasn't this a statement made to the police? Well, I think the important thing isn't what happens after the autopsy report is formed, but what happened before. And since before the autopsy was performed, um, like the police did not specifically request that the autopsy report had happened, but it was sent after the fact that it was made by the Brandeis statute that is the more important factor. Okay. Um, and then what about the third factor? The regular course of business? Regular course of business. So. Um, that goes back to the Brandeis statute that it wasn't made. Um, I believe there was a case um, in Bullcoming where the police even escorted the individual to the blood test, sat with them, the individual was in handcuffs, 
So one would not believe that that was made in the regular course of business per se, that there's only one explanation for why somebody in handcuffs would be at a blood test, whereas with an autopsy report, there are a list of reasons as why those would happen. Makes sense. Okay, we'll stop there. Good job. Uh, so uh, I thought you did lots well. What you're saying. Yep, I agree with all of that. I thought that um, you did a really good job knowing the record, too. Um, we've talked before about how even though an appeal is not the time to re-litigate facts, it is the time to apply a rule to certain facts in order to win that application, you've got to know the facts. Um, and so, uh, you know, my uh, first question or two about um, whether there was a suspect or not, you really relied, in, in, you know, effectively uh, impressively on, you knew the officer had testified that he believed it was a suicide um, from the get-go, um, and that there was this regulation that automatically requires an autopsy, um, and so I think you did a good job. Um, you know, I think uh, watch out for the follow-up question or the follow-up yeah. to the follow-up question, and that goes for everybody. Um, it's the the more follow the more follow-up questions, the harder. Uh, it gets because a questioner will just drill down and drill down and drill down. And don't be afraid to sometimes just repeat an answer. You know, if sometimes their sometimes their follow-up question is not really asking for additional information. It's pretending to ask for additional information, but really just ask the same question again. Um, and you know, if you can think of a way to reframe it or rephrase it so that it doesn't sound like you're repeating yourself, terrific. Um, but worst comes to worst, um, you know, you, know, you can you can say, you know, I, I, I think my answer to the last question is 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 also. Um, the answer to this question, and, and that is that blah well, blah. Just say the answer to the last question if you're in that situation. So, gotcha. um, but I think you did a really nice job. So, good job. Um, all right. Thanks. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so I've heard people say, "May it please the court." Like, at what point do you say that? It can be. It, it can be the first thing out of your mouth. <laughs> Say, uh, good morning, may it please the court. My name is Shelby Boyd. I represent the representative you're offering. Okay, thank you. Uh, real quick, Zach, uh, the TA told me yesterday or the day before that may it please the court is a question that you're supposed to ask them and get an answer rather than just say it. So I don't know if that's really, yeah, he, yeah, he said that this morning. That's why I paused and then waited. And yeah, I, I didn't see you look up, so I was like, okay, I've never <laughs> heard of that. Maybe that's like a moot court. Mm -hmm. Thing. Okay. So, then you all, he'll be here on, but your all competition starts before Wednesday, right? Yeah. Maybe should we just like pause, like try to make eye contact, and then if nothing happens, just move on? Like, For the competition, uh, maybe. Yeah. I mean, Zach probably is, prob Zach probably is informed about what the Moot Court board cares about. So, that makes sense to me. If he said it, go with that. Um, but for Saturday, I wouldn't worry about it, and in real life, I wouldn't worry about it. I've never heard, I've never heard a judge answer that. I've never really heard even ask. What would they say? I mean, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that for a moment. <laughs> Take a bite of the donut. I'm not pleased about. Um, no, I think it's anyway. I'll, I also think that um, um, I probably wouldn't even say anyway. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's custom in the Supreme Court and maybe for state Supreme Court, but for lower courts, I'm not even sure that I would be that. Uh, but for the Moot Court competition, do whatever they say. No, know your audience. I think you thought we were going to get through a class without saying anything else. <laughs> okay. Ready when you are, Dimitri. Your Honors, may it please the court. Yes, we're thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> so pleased. <laughs> Tickled to be here. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honors. My name is. I'm sorry. Okay. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Dimitri Johnson Cantu, and I represent the appellant Ronald Miller. At this time, I would like to request two minutes for rebuttal. That's no problem. Uh, Your Honors, we respectfully request that this court reverse and remand the decision, uh, the state's previous decision, because Mr. Miller's Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause rights were violated when the court admitted into evidence Elizabeth Miller's autopsy report and death certificate. 
Mr. Miller's rights under the Confrontation Clause were violated for three reasons. First, Elizabeth Miller's autopsy report and death certificate were testimonial because they satisfy the primary purpose test. Second, the autopsy report or Elizabeth Miller's autopsy report and death certificate satisfied Thomas's formality test. And although the formality uh, of a statement is not as important of a test as the primary purpose test, it's still an important factor. Third, Dr. Adler's surrogate testimony was insufficient. Can you um, can you tell us the standard of review, please? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. The standard of review is de novo. Great, great. Um, and so um, let's talk about the primary purpose test. Um, Dr. Hines believed he was dealing with a suicide when he started, right? Yes, Your Honor. Um, and there was no suspicion of any crime. Well, Your Honor, um, in this case, because the suspicious nature of the death um, being a suicide without a note, uh, it's Indiana uh, statute requires that it be sent from Officer Thomas to the coroner's office and an autopsy be uh, was mandatory. So because of the, the autopsy was because of the uh, suspicious nature of the crime and our defendant Ronald Miller, who I represent is, was the only suspect uh, because he was the only one in the house confirmed by Officer Thomas at the time. So I had a question that I forgot last night. Um, who suspected that that it was a crime? You said that I said there was no suspicion. You disagreed. Fair enough. Um, who who did the suspecting? Well, it is uh, it's built into the statute um, that this is a suspicious crime. And although at the beginning, um, at the crime scene, there there was no real suspicion by Officer Thomas. He still conducted an investigation and believed that his uh, that this autopsy report would complete a thorough investigation and continue. Actually, if I could state the record, um, that in the autopsy report, if I can find it, um, Dr. Hines con er, stated that all documents and evidence examined were by telephone conversations with Officer Thomas. So Officer Thomas continued to work on this investigation, and that showed some sus suspicion as well, and that this is that, in, that this needed to be, or the manner of death needed to be determined. And so the primary purpose of this autopsy report was to establish the manner of death, um, and if it was, in fact, a homicide, then it would be potentially used for like a criminal investigation, or prosecution. So that all makes sense to me, and I think you have an impressive knowledge of the record. Um, and you persuaded me that Officer Thomas did act as if he was somewhat suspicious. Um, but I think Officer Thomas testified that he was not suspicious. So, number one, is that true that he testified that? And number two, if so, why did he say something that wasn't true? Your Honor, uh, Officer Thomas. Sure. I had a little bit of my morning vodka. Yes, sir. So, or yes, Your Honor. Um, I believe he did say that at the time he wasn't suspicious. However, there was still a lot of questions unanswered, um, and it was mandatory for him to, to for this autopsy. Um, and he was he he was showed up at the autopsy himself, um, so he, he did want to to see more. Why? Uh, I mean, at the time, really, the notion that that Ronald Miller uh, could be a suspect at the at the time that this was established comes from Williams, which is a plurality. It's not very really binding. And our case is similar to Davis, where um, Amy Hammond was was separated from her partner, and and the partner was not a suspect until a crime was revealed by Amy Hammond's statements, which statements in that case are similar to the autopsy report. So 
the, the defendant in that trial was not a suspect at the time. However, that, that evidence was still testimonial. Good, good. All right, we're out of time. Thank you, John. Uh, so I thought you did lots of things well. Uh, we had a good use of precedent. Uh, I felt like I had a good time. And you answered that were like really hard questions that really weren't in your favor. So you answered that one. What are you yeah, saying, yeah, Bailey? No. <laughs> um, so I thought you did a great job. And uh, you know, I think that, first of all, you did a really nice job um, asking for time to go through the record and finding it. You found it really quickly. So not only what, do I think you did a nice job, you have I was just going to add. Okay, well, I was talking about that. That's good. I'll come back. Don't do um, I thought that um, not only was it perfectly fine to ask for time to go through the record, um, but um, you got there pretty quickly, which suggests that, like, you had some familiarity with the structure of the record. I mean, obviously, you found it faster than if you had read 18 pages at word for word while you looked for the thing. So, um, I think there's a good lesson there. Number one, take the record with you. Um, take your brief with you. Um, and it's not enough to just take it with you. Um, it, you need to know it well enough that, that you can look through it pretty effectively, pretty efficiently. Um, so that, that was good. Um, I also think um, you, know, you did a good job keeping your cool. When I was asking questions that were a little out of left field, I, mean, I think they were fair questions that um, a non-ridiculous judge would might ask, but um, you know there weren't questions that you, you could have prepared a hundred questions ahead of this, answers to hundred questions, and those questions might not have been on the list. And so um, it's important um, to not let that throw you, even if you haven't prepared for that exact question. Like you spent a semester researching and writing this stuff, you know this stuff better than the judges do and you got this, even if you haven't prepared that exact question. Um, don't feel like your preparation was in vain um, if you get asked a question that you weren't ready for. Um, I can remember doing a job interview where I prepared more for this job interview than for any job interview I've ever done, and it went terribly. And one of the reasons it went terribly is they were asking questions I had prepared for, and I, was, I got flustered because I was like, I was thinking to myself like, I spent weeks like ready to answer I spent weeks studying for the wrong exam, and now I'm flunking the exam they're actually giving. Um, but if I had just like kept my cool a little bit, like Dimitri did, I was perfectly capable of passing the exam they gave me. Maybe I wouldn't have shined as much as if I had been given the exam I had prepared for, but I still would have done better than, than I ended up doing. So good job on that. And the last thing I point out is I think that I think you were wrong about Davis and how it applies to our case, um, but. The judge, here's the thing, the judges are going to have no idea. <laughs> cool. You mentioned Kalen, like, they, they, have no, they don't know Kalen from Johnny Appleseed. There's, so, um, you know, don't make stuff up, I'm not telling you to do that. Um, but it, it, I do think you should, like, you know, go into it knowing that they're not going to be able to ask, like, a, a brutally incisive follow-up question that um, takes issue with some premise of your answer that depends on a fact from a from an obscure precedent or even a non-obscure precedent. So, um, so good, good job. Yeah, your question. Oh, uh, yeah, I was gonna actually also comment on like you looking for the record. So I, I know you said we could do that, but I was kind of terrified it would sound horrible, and it didn't at all. Like, oh, it, sweet, thank yeah, you. It, it sounded like it didn't sound like you were unprepared just when you said it just sounded like, oh, this is just a normal thing. And so I wasn't even, I guess, as impressed as how quickly you found it, just the fact that you asked for it at all and you asked for it so quickly. Just like, so I feel like that, so just seeing it gave me permission now if I need to, it's okay. Good, good, great comment. So what's a good answer to your question, too? Because that, that was... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he can't see it. I, I was going to say, like, when no, no, is no, the... No, let's you start it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you're the, uh, like, for the government and you hear something, because they go first, right, the defendant? The defendant goes first. If you hear something in their uh, argument that you want to bring up in yours, would you, like, reserve two minutes of your own to put, like, all that at the end, or when would you incorporate that? I would lead with it, probably. Lead with what they said? Um, or at least get to it pretty quickly um, because 
you know, the government is supposed to be, look, the, the, the government's brief here is called a response brief. Mm. So your brief was supposed to be responsive to what the defendant said yeah. and your oral argument like it. Now, you know, there's a strategy to not being totally on the defensive. You also want, you want to be, you know, on the, you want to make an affirmative case for why you're right. Yeah. Um, but um, I think it's, you know, if, if you, you know, see blood in the water, then, you know, it counts. Would you do that before the roadmap even? Um, I don't know. It might depend on how important you think. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, you can incorporate it would be even better. Yeah. Um, I can imagine doing a quick roadmap, um, and then when you get to the part of your argument that is relevant to what the defendant messed up in saying or what the judge said mm. that you find helpful, then referring to it then. Okay. Um, but I could also imagine if you think it's, like, decisive, um, saying, you know, good morning, Your Honors, I'd like to start right away um, by responding to something that my opponent said. Okay. That's, that could be a shine of a sign of strength. Okay. Uh, be sure you do it in, in a civil way. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, you don't have to do it with, like, sunshine and, and, you know, like, you know, kumbaya, but um, you shouldn't do it. You should, you should always make clear to the judge that your purpose is to help the judge un understand the law um, and figure out the right answer. Your purpose, you should never get the impression your purpose is to just, like, make your opponent look bad. So, so, with the suspicion thing, um, should I just say, like... Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, <laughs> so much easier to ask questions than answer them. Right? So, um, I mean, I would, I would say, you know, he, he acted as if he had suspicions. And um, I can't know for sure exactly what he meant by his answer, but I suspect he meant by his answer that um, he believed it was a suicide. Um, in, until later, but probably still had some suspicions that or that that, that was not the case, or that it was on, that there was some room for uncertainty. Uh, you know, I don't know. I try to say something like that. Thank you. And I also thought you did a good job of saying, and I would say. He did act. He did act suspicious. He did act as if he was suspicious, which shows he was suspicious, regardless of you know whether we want to take what he said overly literally or not. And in any event, the question of whether or not there was suspicion is not the right test. Oh. Williams was a plurality, as you pointed out, and that's not the inquiry that Melendez Diaz and Wolfley make. And those opinions are made. so. You you basically said that you know by pointing out the Williams. You used a little shorthand at that point, and that was a curse of knowledge thing, because although it was to your advantage that they wouldn't know you were wrong about Davis and yeah. Hammond, it was to your disadvantage that they wouldn't know you were right about Williams, because you didn't really explain Williams in a way that I think they understand. But you're, you're, it's practice. Yes, sir. You're, everyone's new for learning. So. Thank you. Good job. OK, Shelby, you ready when you are. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. I'm Shelby Boyd, and I'm representing the appellant, Mr. Ron Miller. Your Honor, we respectfully ask this court to reverse Mr. Miller's conviction for the murder of his wife, as his constitutional right to confront witnesses against him was violated. Your Honor, the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution provides defendants with the right to confront witnesses testifying against them. The framers of the Constitution drafted this clause to protect Americans from, fr from frivolous use of testimony by the government in convicting defendants. Mr. Ronald Miller's right was violated by the state of Brandeis since he was unable to confront Dr. Hines about the autopsy report. Uh, I'm, I'll interrupt you there. That's all nicely done and, and, and helpful. Um, let's just think big picture for a second. I think the autopsy report was reliable. It was conducted by a neutral person, Dr. Hines. No vendetta against Mr. Miller. Um, Dr. Hines is an expert. Qualifications have not been criticized. Dr. Adler testified 
Dr. Adler is an expert. Her qualifications have not been criticized. The jury was able to see, you know, what maybe some of the flaws of the report were, um, but they ultimately decided it was reliable. Reliable enough that they concluded this was a murder and not a suicide. And I have to say, from my perspective, I also find it sufficiently reliable. Assume that I am going to believe the report is reliable. It's reliable evidence. I don't think it's wrong. Assume I think it's reliable. Why isn't that dispositive? Your Honor, I'd like to address two points on that question. First off, uh, the notion of reliability comes from the William from Williams, which was a, a plurality case. So it's um, though it is official law, it was not. Um, we shouldn't. We should take it with a grain of salt, Your Honor. Um, so re reliability was crucial to Williams. Um, but I'm not sure that it should be applied with full force in this case. So, however, even if you consider reliability to be important for this case, um, the question of reliability is not what is applied by the Constitution. Um, we are not concerned, Your Honor, with uh, the abilities of Dr. Adler or Dr. Hines. We're concerned with whether or who actually performed the autopsy. This is because we are aware of human error that can happen, and we want to ensure the framers of the Constitution wanted to protect individuals from, from human error that can happen. And because Dr. Adler herself did not perform the autopsy, was not present for the autopsy, and could not replicate the autopsy, she is simply uh, insufficient to act in Dr. Hines' place. I think that's a great answer. Um, and Emily thinks so too. Um, Emily was like, wow. <laughs> um, so uh, I have one last question before we run out of time. Um, the inspiration for the Sixth Amendment by the framers that you were talking about was this Walter Raleigh debacle. And I think that that is just a very different situation than what we have. 